Anyway, I um, wanted to uh, tell you about this trip I had. I have a gig to do. I call up the, the promoter guy, the college guy. I go like, okay, I'm having a slight problem in getting to the gig. I will be there. So TWA gets me out late out of New York. I get late to St. Louis. I go to every airline looking. No flights to Tulsa. I call my manager's assistant. And so I said, look, I I'm screwed. Uh, the flight got me up late. I got no way to get to Tulsa. I don't know what to do. You got any ideas? She goes, uh, call me in an hour and I'll figure out something. So I walk around the airport for an hour, just waiting. Call her back in an hour. She says, okay, okay, I've got it. Found a place in Tulsa. Private airlines, they fly chartered air company. They're gonna send a guy out from Tulsa to St. Louis. You'll make the gig. I'm like, okay. She said, do you have a problem with flying in a single propeller plane? Everything in me goes <laughs> And all I've ever heard is that single propeller planes are as intense as it gets, you know, in an airplane. <laughs> Tiny little plane comes rolling up to the side, man gets out, comes in, leather jacket, baseball cap on, says Zildjian across the front, that's symbols for, for drums. He goes, hello, I'm looking for a guy named Henry. I go like, he goes, okay, Henry, hi, I'm your pilot, my name is Eric, and uh, I'm gonna fuel this plane up, we're gonna turn around and we're gonna haul ass to Tulsa. I'm like, okay. At the same time, I'm checking Eric out, like I check out every pilot. I go, Zildjian, what, you have a friend in a band? Oh, no, 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 I'm a drummer. Oh, so you're a drummer and a pilot who's going to be transporting me through the air. Yeah, I'm in a cover band. Danger, danger, danger. Easily one of the lowest aspirations in the world. And so I realize I'm getting in the plane with a guy who can play, play that funky music white boy as well as fly. I go out to approach the craft. It is a canoe with a tiny plank over it for wings. I go up to the door. It resembles the door of a golf cart. Unlock. This corny little door I can just pull off and give back to the guy. The space between the two seats is like this wide. I put my computer in there and my little backpack and I get in and I sit in my seat. It's like tiny. I close the door and I look at the lock because I'm used to being hermetically sealed into an airplane. Like, you know, arm doors for departure. That's intense. Arm the doors. Like, pressurize the cabin. My shit was lock. Unlock. Lock, unlock, lock, unlock. So I lock it, and the door just shakes. I unlock it, just flies open. So one little latch is what keeps me from getting sucked out of the side of the plane like the airplane movie. So I go, okay, make sure the door is locked. Put the seatbelt on. Do not get sucked out the window. Do not touch the door. If you bump into it, you might undo the latch. Don't do anything like that. The steering wheel, there's two steering wheels, one for him and one for me. I don't know, I do not want a steering wheel. So Eric hops in the other side, and he turns the key and fires up this baby. And I am used to like feeling that stuff rearrange my innards. You know, they're like, well, we're ready for takeoff. Damn, man, we're going places. You get the idea that there's hamsters on bullet like <laughs> We go tooling around the International Airport of St. Louis looking for the runway. We're just driving around. We come up to major intersections. He stops. Gives us look like for like 10 minutes, we drive around the airport, just tooling around, just having a great Sunday afternoon, driving around, and finally, we get in some line of airplanes. Now, if you've all been to the airport, and you've all had a plane take off in front of you, and, you know, you hear it and you feel it, but you are surrounded by, you know, this much aluminum and insulation and lexane and all that protective stuff, when you are inside one of these planes, that plane is basically taking off in your ass. The sound is amazing. Your lungs are going. 
is unreal loud. So finally, it is our time to take our approach down the runway, and we do it. People are walking by the airplane. And I think the reason they make runways so long is not for the commercial jets, it's for these airplanes. Because you have to wait for some wind to blow at you to push you into the air. It was like an act of God that we were in the air, like and now we were airborne. Eric pulls out a road map, folds it over the two wheels, takes his hand off the wheel, starts looking at this map, looking out the windshield. Hand off the wheel. We hit wind, the wheels start like jabbing. And we go, and every time the wind blows, you can feel it in the propeller. It noticeably slows down. We kind of drop, I'm like, so I said, Eric, uh, shouldn't you keep your hands on the wheel? Oh, no, this is okay. I said, Eric, I hear that when you uh, drive an airplane, you're supposed to drive with very tiny adjustments. He goes, well, I don't know who told you that. He grabs me and starts going like this. The plates are going, yeah, 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 like, all orifices are opening, opening, opening. So I try and make, I go, Eric, Eric, Eric. Please, please don't do that. I, you know, I'm really used to the big planes. I'm a real puss, okay? I'm just not into it. Here, why don't you try flying it? Here, put your hands on the wheel. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's not even get into this conversation. <laughs> and a few minutes in, you hear from miles above us a commercial plane coming into the airport. The entire plane starts vibrating. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, oh. I don't know that it's way up there. I think it's gonna like go and just like just push us, you know, like, and just like, Eric, he leans over the wheel with this kind of nervous looking goes. And everything in him says, fuck, I hope this is okay. About two and a half hours go by. He looks down. Uh oh. You do not want to hear a guy in a cover band who's flying you in a canoe with a lawnmower-sized engine saying, "Uh uh-oh. What do you mean, oh, uh, we're a little low on gas. How low, Eric? Uh, We have to land right now. And for the first time, he gets on the radio. Hi, uh, it's Eric. Eric the pilot. I like to rock and roll, man. Whips out the map. I I think I'm flying over Grove, Oklahoma. Can I have permission to land at the local airport? When you land in a 737 into LAX, you start landing, like in Phoenix. Our descent was about a 90 degree angle. Our descent had my asshole go into my throat. (laughs) Yeah, it took like seven feet to land. He could land in a parking place. And so I go, Eric, what are you gonna do now? Well, I uh, better call my boss and see what we can do. Because there's no one at the airstrip. Nobody. No lights except for one bug light over the payphone. No traffic. No city lights. No nothing. Just warm, dry, prairie wind. Me and this guy from a cover band. <laughs> I said, so now what? He goes, well, my boss is calling the lady who owns this place. She's going to come over, open up the gas pump. We're going to fuel up. I'm going to get you to Tulsa as fast as I can. I'm really sorry. I'm like, that's cool, Eric. Okay. I walk over to the phone, dial it. No dial tone, no nothing. The phone is dead as a doornail. Hit the receiver a few times, nothing. Put it down. Eric didn't call anybody. Eric's not a pilot. Eric is a weird groupie fanboy, fatal attraction guy. One of those guys with a criminal intellect so intense, he can just go into an airplane, figure out how it works, take off, take Henry Rollins through the night sky, put him in a small airport, and slash him to death. And then he's going to go to the gate, covered in my blood, and walk out and go, I had a rough trip to Tulsa. And everyone's going to go, you're not Henry Rollins. Yes, I am. Yes, I am him. See? And they'll show the tattoos, but they're all drawn on. And I'm mad, I'll tell you, I'm mad, mad, ah! And of course, they'll be carted away, and they'll find me in four plastic bags in Grove, Oklahoma. So, knowing all this is true, I keep my distance from Eric. I go, Eric, uh, what's up with that phone, pal? 
I don't know, it worked for me. Oh, yeah, it worked for you. <laughs> Waiting to see the glint of the blade in the bug light as he comes to stab and stab and stab. So I say, okay, Eric, I'm going to take a walk around the airport. I'll be right back. And I just casually walk away like, yeah, no problem. I'm scared of you, motherfucker. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to die. <laughs> Two headlights appear out of the darkness. Pull up, lady gets out. I go up to her, ma'am, uh, your phone is kind of screwy. Can I go in and use yours? She's like, come on in, son. So I go in, and I get on the phone, and I call Marilyn. Henry, where is Eric? I go, he's out fueling up the plane. Henry, do not get back in the airplane. <laughs> well, why not? Eric is not a commercial pilot. The place I thought I was renting a plane from is not a chartered airlines. It is an airplane refueling center. Eric was the only one working on the shift. I dropped your name. He is a massive fan of yours. He closed down the place, rented a plane, did not register the flight with the FAA. Totally illegal. He's going to be stripped of his license. Thoroughly dangerous. No one really knew you were in the air. You could have really had a problem. I'm like, damn. <laughs> Because, like, you know, what I was thinking was kind of true. She goes, just tell me where you are. The students are ready to come and pick you up. They go, okay. So I, I say, ma'am, um, where can I be dropped off to wait? Is there a hotel? It's a hotel in Grove? Son, I can take you down the street and drop you off at one of two gas stations. One is open, one is closed. What do you have? I went, I don't care, you know, either one, whatever's closer. Son, you don't want to sit in front of the closed gas station. If our police see you in front of a closed gas station at this hour, you're in a lot of trouble. What, the cops that intense? She said, have you ever seen Deliverance? <laughs> I'm not kidding, she said this. I was like, the open one, no problem. <laughs> and so Eric comes back in. He goes, okay, well, the plane is full, let's go. And there's like this silence. <laughs> Eric, I'm not going anywhere with you. Well, um, uh... Why not? I mean, he's like a guy who's like totally busted, but he's like still trying to front it. Uh, why? <laughs> Eric, you're not a commercial pilot. Sure I am. Sure, I fly all the time. Eric, you didn't register the flight. You endangered both of us. Bye, Eric. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, man. See you. Leaves. <clears throat> Into the night he goes. This lady takes me a mile down the road to Mr. M's convenience store slash gas mart. I'm watching the people of Grove, Oklahoma pull up and go in and out of the store. And they're doing triple takes on me. Get out of the pickup truck. And they walk in. Three cops get out and stop in a semicircle around me and start approaching slowly. And I go, hey, fellas, how you doing? They're like, don't move. I'm like, whoa, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Cool. He goes, youngest cop comes up. What are you doing here? So I have no vehicle. I don't look like anybody from around here. Black military fatigue pants, black baggy sweatshirt, dark hair, black backpack, black computer bag, black watch. <laughs> Terrorist. <laughs> Mission Impossible wannabe. Mercenary. Not the flavor in Grove. Sir, a liquor store was robbed about a mile from here. You fit the description. I go, oh, yeah. So what's that description? Still trying to be, see how harmless and funny I am? If I was guilty, I'd be going for a weapon or running or showing perspiration, but I'm laughing with you guys. Um, dark hair. Dark clothing, short. <laughs> Sir, we're gonna have to go through your bags. Oh, of course, I lean down to start opening the bags. Don't move, I'm like, sorry, sorry. Guy goes through the bag very carefully, pulls out the rolls of toilet paper I've been stealing from the hotels. <laughs> so embarrassing. Like, pulls out like forks, knives, you know, a Denny's cup, I'm like, doesn't find any guns or money. He goes, uh, sir, I hate to disturb you and all this. It's probably nothing, but uh, 
What car did you come up here in? I came with a lady who runs the airport. It was a, a dark red sports car. They all stiffen up. Son, the getaway car was a red sports car. You're going to have to stay here while we bring the witness. I'm like, hey, cool, no problem. They bring up this guy. He looks at me, shakes his head, drives away. The cops go, hey, sorry to you know disturb your evening. This is our job. I'm like, hey, man, I'm not even mad. It's cool. So they leave, and I now go into Mr. M's to buy a cold drink, and all I find is a bottle of V8 juice with a dusty cap. Like, no one drinks this shit. It was a mistake. It came off the truck. So I pull it out, $1.79, I put it down, pull out $2 and gives it to this, give it to this lady who's been watching me get hassled by the cops. So she already has an attitude with me. Looks at the V8 juice and looks at me, and the whole look is like, what are you, a fag? So I'm like, you know, give her the money, give me my juice. So I'm sitting there, and the woman's just kind of leaning over. There's only two of us in there. She's leaning over, looking at me. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. My son was just in here a little while ago, and he says that you look like this guy named Henry Rollins. I go, ma'am, that's who I am. She goes, oh, um, is it okay if I call him and have him come here and get your autograph, because if he found out it was you and I didn't call him, he'll be really mad at me. I go, hey, no problem, got nothing to do. Call your son, bring him over. 20 minutes later, cars start pulling up. <laughs> the son had done a little networking around Grove <laughs> using his Alterna Youth phone book. These kids with their hair still drying, you know, they're about to go to bed. It's like, you know, 12.30 in the morning. They're about to go to bed, they get the call, you're not going to believe this, the fucking MTV guy is at Mr. M's. <laughs> get out of here. Yep, I'm a liar, I'm a liar. That guy, the red guy, he's at Mr. M's. Get the fuck out. I'm on my way over there. My mom said it's him. He said it was him. I'm going over there. I'm going to meet this guy. And within, you know, half an hour, Mr. M's has like a, a small gaggle of Grove Alterna youth around me replete in, you know, Celtic weave, tattoo, pierced nose, pierced ears, pierced lip, pierced eyebrow, Marilyn Manson t-shirt with the awesome shit on the back. I am the god of fuck. The world is a cold place and you will eventually die. Heavy guy. I never met the dude, but I read some of his interviews. I think he's really sharp. And I, there's something inherently cool about a bunch of teenagers coming home with that record going, Mom, I'm into this guy. And like this, like, bisexual, tall man in white body paint, jet black hair who like calls his record Antichrist Superstar. Mom, I'm into that. Look what a shitty parent you turned out to be. Look how you raised me. So, they're coming up to me, like, one step at a time. I feel like I'm one of those National Geographic guys encountering a herd of gorillas for the first time. They've never seen a human. You know, so they're like, these kids are coming up. They're not coming, hey man, how you doing? They're like. coming up to me like, Henry? I'm like, yep. What are you doing in Grove at near one in the morning? You're not going to believe this. I get in an airplane with a guy. He's wearing a Zildjian cap. He says he's in a cover band. What was I thinking? Well, I like to get to the gig. I tell him the story. I'm cracking him up and I'm just looking at the, just like, not exactly wonder, but almost disbelief on their faces. Like, MTV man, aging alternative icon, drops out of night sky. It was written. <laughs> if you make the correct signals with your flashlight, he will come. <laughs> Owa, Tanu, you know, whatever. So I'm hanging out, one resourceful young man goes down the street, buys a paper camera, the photo session ensues, put your arm around the alternative icon hurtling towards 40. And they're like, you know, like, you know, like 13 photos later, you know, it must be looking like, you know, they're standing next to President Clinton or something. It was like that ironed on smile, like, and so more kids are coming in and they're all, I like $5 on. Henry? 
hi, I'm surrounded by like these vampire kids. I'm like, yeah, they're coming over. We've been in Tulsa for like three hours waiting for you. There's some guy in an airplane who is flying. Oh, yeah, and I have to tell him the story. About an hour after that, the students finally come and get me. I get to Tulsa at like three in the morning, dick around in the hotel till four, catch the six o'clock flight, get back to my hovel, change, go to band practice on no sleep, walk in and everyone goes, well, how's the weekend? And I said, I don't want to talk about it. And we proceeded to rock and roll. <laughs> goes on up here. If it does, the performer is trying to disguise it so you think he never fucks up. You know, you go to a major rock show, it goes off flawlessly. The first show of the year starts in Brazil, a country we have never been to. I am so thrilled to be in Brazil. Santos, it's an outdoor festival, free admission. They're expecting 30 to 60,000 people outside on the beach, the moon, the sea. Us, Evan Dando, and Mr. Big. I have but one mission. Destroy. I will not even talk to Evan when I see him. I've never met him before, but he plays that music that just drives me nuts. That girl music. I know, bad again, don't say something like girl music. What I mean is, he plays that music, like, you're nice and I'm a cool guy too. And women just go running at him. You hear like, <laughs> what's that sound? It's women running after Evan Dando. 13 to 25 years old, stupid, beautiful women going, Evan, Evan. He's just like, oh, hi, how are you? No, you can't come back to my hotel room. I got to read and have some milk and cookies and go to bed. You know, so I'm looking at this guy like, you die tonight. The unbelievable crushing fist of the Rollins band will just turn you into fucking mincemeat, you motherfucker. Because I have a horrible attitude with current music. Because I listen to, you know, alternative radio. I listen to what is selling millions of copies. And the lyrics are cute and smirking. Like, <laughs> I kind of like chicks. <laughs> Not really, though. <laughs> Truckloads of records fly out the door. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, me and my torrid crew of guys are ripping our guts. They're like people like, uh-huh, just stick that up your ass, okay? And they leave. <laughs> so anyway, Brazil. The drummer comes up to me, our drummer. Henry, come and meet Evan. Fuck no, man, I'm gonna kill him, man. I kill everyone. <laughs> Henry's a really nice guy. He's been into you for years. Come and meet him. Okay. Come over, Henry, shake hands. I'm like eight, you know. <laughs> Evan is one of the coolest people I've ever met. Total sweetheart, nicest guy, he's excellent. So I'm like, sorry for being a dick. You know, <laughs> go away. But then I get back into my head thing, man. I've got to rock and roll tonight. First gig of the tour, I'm going to fucking kill everyone. South America, they're going to see, like, sweat, muscle, screaming, rock power. So I get myself into a lathered frenzy before we hit stage. I'm already sweating. It's so hot out. It's nighttime, and you're just, like, standing there sweating. We hit stage. The band comes crashing in on the first tune. I have not said a word yet. My head comes down. My knee comes up, bam, knocked my ass out in front of all of them. <laughs> out. Out for like, you know, 12 to 20 seconds, like. And if any of you have ever been hit hard in the head, you know how lost you get. You don't know your name, you don't know anything. I get up wondering where the guy is who's attacking me. So I'm like, Knowing I'm just going to get killed now because this guy's just going to pound me into the... I must have offended somebody. Maybe it's Evan. You know? So I'm like... And my head is like... And I'm hearing this weird sound behind me. It sounds like a horrible band trying to play some really good music. I turn around looking for my attackers. There's three people back there. Bass drum set, guitar, and they're both playing, but the music doesn't seem to be coming from their instruments at all. It's coming like, 
like this, way up in the air. I'm like, and they're all looking at me. Are you okay? <laughs> and I'm still, I'm like, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. I look, and you know, my head is rapidly clearing. I look at all these people who are like, I start to put it together in my head. This is like how a gig is. Oh, we're at the gig. Audience, band. Here comes the first verse. Must recover. Who hit me? Ow. Ow. Oh. Reach up to my head. There's a divot going from above my eyebrow, through my eyebrow, stopping at my eyelid. I reach in, in, in. I feel my skull, which I think is pretty cool. Because I've been mangled in a few ways where I got to kind of see some of my innards. Like I've seen my testes. I've seen like, you know, muscle, you know, from cutting my arm open and shit. And so I'm like, oh, my skull. And I think maybe I should turn around and show it to our drummer. Hey, Sim, look, my tendon. He's back like, oh, oh, God. Oh, eh, ah. So I get my shit together, realize I've hit myself in the head. Magically, I come up with a lyric and I go right in. I've missed a couple of lines, but I managed to kind of get there by the chorus. The band just keeps playing. I mean, we've only been into the gig for like 30 or 40 seconds. Either, you know, either we bag the gig or we just go to the end. So I'm like... I can do this. I can do this. Then I look down. Blood is all over me. Blood is all over the ground. It's a head wound. It's just like... Pff, pff. <laughs> For some people to be like, oh no. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> because in my infantile, twisted Darwinian mind, I think that beautiful Brazilian women are going to see a guy bathed in white light, coming through hundreds of DBs of awesome rock power. They see tattoos, they see muscle, they see blood, and they realize this is the guy they must get the seed from. <laughs> and I imagine waves of beautiful, clamoring Brazilian women crawling over other people to get to me. And they're fighting each other because, no, his seed is mine. Yeah, his seed is mine. I think I'm just going to get torn apart by beautiful women. The crowd is like, they're like backing away from me. I did not meet a single Brazilian woman in three days. All I did was, oh, hi, my name. Yeah, Evan, you go down the hall and you get in line. You know, so I didn't need any. We finished the set. I've left blood here and there. Every time I go like this, I splash it all over Sim and his drum kit. I think I'm a raging rock god. It's going down my face. I'm just like, yes. And I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> the best thing was watching Evan go out afterwards, like in his pajamas. He plays in his pajamas. Like, hi, I'm a nice guy. Standing in my blood. It was awesome. It's like standing in the middle of like Hank's slaughterhouse. I want to tell you about a grand fuck-up. We are headlining the Livid Festival in Australia. Big-ass festival. Hot sun. Everyone's out there in the dirt waiting for us. Hit stage. People in Australia dig us. Go out there with all these new songs. Start the set with a new song. And I'm thinking to myself, I hardly know the words. If I get the first line right, the rest of the song will just fall into place. No problem. So concentrate. Get the first line right. You're in. Okay. All the lyrics to the song disappear off my LED thing. I forget all of it. I am trying to make all these people think that this song has three lines and the rest is just instrumental. That really sounds like a song. I run over to Chris. I have about four and a half minutes to kill. For 90 seconds, I go over to him and rock out with him. Like, and people are buying it. They're like, I'm like, rock power! And everyone's like, fuck yeah! Run over to the drummer, he's up on a platform, like. He's looking down at me like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like, 89, 90, run over to this Melvin, the bass player, he's like, 
doing his thing. I'm like, he's like, get the fuck off me, sing, you idiot. I'm like, shut up. You know, 89, 90. And so I go like, yeah. And the crowd goes, I'm like, yes, they fucking bought it. So I had to fake him out because nothing can go wrong on stage. You cannot have it happen. Awesome rock moment. Rock moment. When I was 15 and heard the song Iron Man, my life changed. And when I heard that voice, and when I heard these songs of alienation and this crushing guitar power, that was my shit. And I've been into Ozzy Osbourne ever since. I got all the Sabbath records, all the Ozzy records, all the bootlegs, Greatest rhythm section in rock and roll is Bill Ward and Geezer Butler. If I ever saw those guys, I'd be all over the place. So anyway, imagine my elation. Several weeks ago, slaving away at band practice, and we get a phone call from management, and uh, manager says, hey, you want to play some shows with Ozzy? Uh, let's see. You know, duh, what do you think? So I go, we are there. Click. How many nights have I put O-Z-Z-Y on my knuckles with, with a Sharpie? God, if I had a nickel for every single night. It is the awesome thing to do when you play festivals and you have to do all this press. Like, uh, Henry, so um, do you like to play the festivals? Yes, I do. <laughs> and weeks later, boom, we're in Florida awaiting our first gig at the Enormo Dome with the Ozman. And we're sitting in our dressing room, which is a locker. And I'm thinking, God, maybe we'll get to like smell Ozzy. Maybe I'll get like to, to touch him. Or like, maybe I'll get a glimpse of him as he goes to the stage. You know, I, no way I'd ever get to meet him, of course. But you know, maybe I'll just get to, you know, s smell his hair care products as he, as he gets golf carted to the stage. <laughs> Door opens up, Ozzy walks in, no shirt and a cigar. Hello, uh, my name is Ozzy Osbourne. Can I hang out with you guys for a while? I run over to the couch, start pulling everyone's you know, backpacks off the couch. Throw, sit, 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 please, please. He sits down. Hey, man, I'm fucking honored you come on tour with us, man. You guys fucking rock out, man. Fucking honored to have you on tour. Fucking God bless you, man. If there's anything you need, man, tell me or my wife and we'll get it for you. Anything you need to be happy, man. We want you to have a fucking great time. We're so happy you're out with us. Was the stage okay? Are the lights okay? Is the PA okay? Anything you want changed, man, we'll do it for you. He's like this totally cool, down-to-earth kind of guy you'd meet in a bar. Doesn't really know where he is. You know, he's just like... <laughs> rock and roll. And he's just super sincere and super cool. He's exactly how I'd hoped he would be. And I'm checking out all his tattoos. I'm like, oh, whoa, there it is. Oh, ZZY, awesome. <laughs> and so we go out that night and we play. And the crowd, which I figure is going like, to tear the seats out and like, beat us to death with them. And we go out there and we do our, you know, kind of off time thing. And we get, <sighs> which means like, you know, rock power. And so we finish, I go, all right, thanks, good night. Ozzy Osbourne's coming up next. And we go off stage. 40 minutes later, change over, Ozzy hits stage. The roof is flapping. And you realize at that moment that is 12,000 people going like, I, I think I dropped a joint on the floor. Excuse me, do, do you know where the men's room is around here? Oh, uh, is there a band playing? <laughs> Times 12,000 is... <sighs> so I realized they didn't even know that we played. <laughs> Ozzy goes out on stage and does basically what he's done for like the last 25 years. It's like... in the crowd go positively bad shit. They're holding up their lighters like with a the yes. At our gigs, when someone holds up a, la a, a lighter, it means we've been jamming too long. It's like, free bird, free bird, pal. You're losing it. See the lighter? But this is like, you know, 
And the people love this guy. Brings people up on stage, puts his arms on them, they head bang together. It's awesome. And he plays his ass off. And um, I meet his wife, Sharon, who's also his manager. She's really cool. And she says, uh, Henry, um, Rip Magazine wants to know if you want to interview Ozzy for the magazine. I'm like, interview Ozzy? Oh, yes. Tomorrow night, when the gig is done, you're going to come with me and Ozzy and the family. We're going to go to the airport. We're going to fly to this island that we're staying at called Amelia Island off the coast of Florida. You're going to get up in the morning, interview Ozzy, and then we have a limousine that's going to take you to your club date. I'm like, okay, so what, there's like a red eye that goes to Amelia Island? No, 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 this is our private jet. Let me get this straight. I'm going to fly on a private jet with Ozzy Osbourne. She goes, yes. She can see it coming. Yet, you know, male fantasy number 5,000. You know, she, she goes, oh my God, he's a fanboy. So I'm saying, like, oh, oh, oh. you know. And so the next night, we do our set. Ozzy does his set. After the show, me and Ozzy and Sharon and his kids get in the van and we go to the private airport. And we pull up and there's all these fanboys waiting at the gate holding their Ozzy records. I'm sitting in the, in the passenger seat up front. They don't recognize me. They think I'm his bodyguard. <laughs> they come up to the van, I, I look at them like, they're like, um, can, can we, um, get our stuff signed by, by Ozzy? Like, hold on, let me ask. <laughs> no, I'm like, just playing it. Ozzy, you want to sign some stuff? Yeah, man, whatever, man. You know, cool. You know, he's really nice. Comes out, you know, he comes out of the van, people are like, whoa. <laughs> he signs their stuff, like, what's your name, man? Uh, uh, David, to David Big, you know, writing rock on Ozzy Osbourne, all these, you know, on, on their like 90 year old vinyl record, gives it back. You know, these guys always have their silver or gold ink pens. And he signs up all their stuff, shakes their hands, and I kind of like move towards them, they're all like, I go, that's enough, we have to go get the plane now. And they're like, oh, you're right, uh, cool, uh, well, to tell, tell Mr. Osborne we're really honored to meet him. Like, he's standing right there, you know, they have to, he has to come through me. I'm like, tell him, you know, like, Ozzy, man, you rule. Like, okay. And so, but at the same time, I'm going, God, I wish I had one of my Ozzy records here so he could sign mine too. <laughs> hey, kid, can I borrow that cool gold ink marker? So we go out onto the tarmac, and there is the Gulfstream jet waiting with the Ozzy logo on the side. Two uniformed pilots, black pants, white shirt, black tie, the gold epaulets, the, the cap, I mean, they look like pro pilots, standing there like, good evening, are you ready to go to Amelia Island? They're totally like, hey. <laughs> and so we get on the plane and the assistant gives us each a diet Pepsi. And Ozzy's sitting in a seat facing the cockpit and I'm sitting in a seat facing him. And for the next hour, I'm sitting this far from Ozzy, drinking a Diet Pepsi, while he tells me Black Sabbath stories. <laughs> 60 minutes, <laughs> the whole time. I just could not believe it. Sitting across, he got the little shades on. It was so cool. I get to the Four Seasons Hotel. They give me the key to the room. I go into this hotel room. I have never been in a place like this in my life. The bed is like a football field. Like, <laughs> dive on it, jumping up and down. These big ass cookies on your bed, condoms in the drawer. I'm like stuffing all this stuff into my shit. <laughs> and so, you know, the next morning, I did the interview with him and the limo came and they you know, took me ac you know, across this like long bridge to the mainland and they drove me like an hour to my club date and the next day we caught back up with Ozzy and it was the coolest man, it was so cool. And it was total fanboy story, just and I, that now you know what I'm like.